I. The fate took place in spite of all the perplexities of the preceding Spigulin day. I believe that even if Lemka had died the previous night, the fate would still have taken place next morning, so peculiar was the significance Yulia Mihailovna attached to it. Alas! Up to the last moment she was blind and had no inkling of the state of public feeling. No one believed at last that the festive day would pass without some tremendous scandal, some catastrophe as some people expressed it, rubbing their hands in anticipation. Many people, it is true, tried to assume a frowning and diplomatic countenance, but, speaking generally, every Russian is inordinately delighted at any public scandal and disorder. It is true that we did feel something much more serious than the mere craving for a scandal, there was a general feeling of irritation, a feeling of implacable resentment, everyone seemed thoroughly disgusted with everything. A kind of bewildered cynicism, a forced, as it were, strained cynicism was predominant in every one. The only people who were free from bewilderment were the ladies, and they were clear on only one point, their remorseless detestation of Yulia Mihailovna. Ladies of all shades of opinion were agreed in this. And she, poor dear, had no suspicion, up to the last hour she was persuaded that she was surrounded by followers, and that they were still fanatically devoted to her. I have already hinted that some low fellows of different sorts had made their appearance amongst us. In turbulent times of upheaval or transition low characters always come to the front everywhere. I am not speaking now of the so-called advanced people who are always in a hurry to be in advance of everyone else, their absorbing anxiety, and who always have some more or less definite, though often very stupid, aim. No, I am speaking only of the riff-raff. In every period of transition this riff-raff, which exists in every society, rises to the surface, and is not only without any aim but has not even a symptom of an idea, and merely does its utmost to give expression to uneasiness and impatience. Moreover, this riffraff almost always falls unconsciously under the control of the little group of advanced people who do act with a definite aim, and this little group can direct all this rabble as it pleases, if only it does not itself consist of absolute idiots, which, however, is sometimes the case. It is said among us now that it is all over, that Pyotr Stepanovich was directed by the Internationale, and Yulia Mihailovna by Pyotr Stepanovich, while she controlled, under his rule, a rabble of all sorts. The more sober minds amongst us wonder at themselves now, and can't understand how they came to be so foolish at the time. What constituted the turbulence of our time and what transition it was we were passing through I don't know, nor I think does anyone unless it were some of those visitors of ours. Yet the most worthless fellows suddenly gained predominant influence, began loudly criticizing everything sacred, though till then they had not dared to open their mouths, while the leading people, who had till then so satisfactorily kept the upper hand, began listening to them and holding their peace, some even simpered approval in a most shameless way. People like Lyamshin and Teliatnikov, like Gogol's Teliatnikov, dribbling homebred editions of Radishchev, Wretched little Jews with a mournful but haughty smile, guffawing foreigners, poets of advanced tendencies from the capital, poets who made up with peasant coats and tarred boots for the lack of tendencies or talents, majors and colonels who ridiculed the senselessness of the service, and who would have been ready for an extra ruble to unbuckle their swords and take jobs as railway. Clerks, generals who had abandoned their duties to become lawyers, advanced mediators, advancing merchants, innumerable divinity students, women who were the embodiment of the woman question, all these suddenly gained complete sway among us and over whom? Over the club, the venerable officials, over generals with wooden legs, over the very strict and inaccessible ladies of our local society. Since even Varvara Petrovna was almost at the beck and call of this rabble, Right up to the time of the catastrophe with her son, our other local Minervas may well be pardoned for their temporary aberration. Now all this is attributed, as I have mentioned already, to the Internationale. This idea has taken such root that it is given as the explanation to visitors from other parts. Only lately Councillor Kubrikov, a man of 62, with the Stanislav Order on his breast, came forward uninvited and confessed in a voice full of feeling that he had beyond a shadow of doubt been for fully three months under the influence of the Internationale. When with every deference for his years and services he was invited to be more definite, he stuck firmly to his original statement, 
though he could produce no evidence except that he had felt it in all his feelings, so that they cross-examined him no further. I repeat again, there was still even among us a small group who held themselves aloof from the beginning, and even locked themselves up. But what lot can stand against a law of nature? Daughters will grow up even in the most careful families, and it is essential for grown-up daughters to dance. And so all these people, too, ended by subscribing to the governess's fund. The ball was assumed to be an entertainment so brilliant, so unprecedented, marvels were told about it, there were rumors of princes from a distance with lorgnettes, of ten stewards, all young dandies, with rosettes on their left shoulder, of some Petersburg people who were setting the thing going. There was a rumor that Karmazinov had consented to increase the subscriptions to the fund by reading his merci in the costume of the governesses of the district, that there would be a literary quadrille all in costume, and every costume would symbolize some special line of thought, and finally that honest Russian thought would dance in costume, which would certainly be a complete novelty in itself. Who could resist subscribing? Everyone subscribed. 2. The program of the fete was divided into two parts, the literary matinee from midday till four o'clock, and afterwards a ball from ten o'clock onwards through the night. But in this very program there lay concealed germs of disorder. In the first place, from the very beginning a rumor had gained ground among the public concerning a luncheon immediately after the literary matinee, or even while it was going on, during an interval arranged expressly for it, a free luncheon, of course, which would form part of the program and be accompanied by champagne. The immense price of the tickets, three rubles, tended to confirm this rumor. As though one would subscribe for nothing? The fate is arranged for 24 hours, so food must be provided. People will get hungry. This was how people reasoned in the town. I must admit that Yulia Mihailovna did much to confirm this disastrous rumor by her own heedlessness. A month earlier, under the first spell of the great project, she would babble about it to anyone she met, and even sent a paragraph to one of the Petersburg papers about the toasts and speeches arranged for her fate. What fascinated her most at that time was the idea of these toasts, she wanted to propose them herself and was continually composing them in anticipation. They were to make clear what was their banner, what was it? I don't mind betting that the poor dear composed nothing after all, they were to get into the Petersburg and Moscow papers, to touch and fascinate the higher powers and then to spread the idea over all the provinces of Russia, rousing people to wonder and imitation. But for toasts, champagne was essential, and as champagne can't be drunk on an empty stomach, it followed that a lunch was essential too. Afterwards, when by her efforts a committee had been formed and had attacked the subject more seriously, it was proved clearly to her at once that if they were going to dream of banquets there would be very little left for the governesses, however well people subscribed. There were two ways out of the difficulty, either Belshazzar's feast with toasts and speeches, and ninety rubles for the governesses, or a considerable sum of money with the fate only as a matter of form to raise it. The committee, however, only wanted to scare her, and had of course worked out a third course of action, which was reasonable and combined the advantages of both that is, a very decent fate in every respect only without champagne, and so yielding a very respectable sum, much more than ninety rubles. But Yulia Mihailovna would not agree to it, her proud spirit revolted from paltry compromise. She decided at once that if the original idea could not be carried out they should rush to the opposite extreme, that is, raise an enormous subscription that would be the envy of other provinces. The public must understand, she said at the end of her flaming speech to the committee that the attainment of an object of universal human interest is infinitely loftier than the corporeal enjoyments of the passing moment, that the fate in its essence is only the proclamation of a great idea, and so we ought to be content with the most frugal German ball simply as a symbol, that is, if we can't dispense with this detestable ball altogether, so great was the aversion she suddenly conceived. For it. But she was pacified at last. It was then that the literary quadrille and the other aesthetic items were invented and proposed as substitutes for the corporeal enjoyments. It was then that Karmazinov finally consented to read Merci, until then he had only tantalized them by his hesitation, 
and so eradicate the very idea of vittles from the minds of our incontinent public. So the ball was once more to be a magnificent function, though in a different style. And not to be too ethereal it was decided that tea with lemon and round biscuits should be served at the beginning of the ball, and later on orcade and lemonade and at the end even ices, but nothing else. For those who always and everywhere are hungry and, still more, thirsty, they might open a buffet in the farthest of the suite of rooms and put it in charge of Prohorovich, the head cook of the club, who would, subject to the strict supervision of the committee, serve whatever was wanted, at a fixed charge, and a notice should be put up on the door of the hall that refreshments were extra. But on the morning they decided not to open the buffet at all for fear of disturbing the reading, though the buffet would have been five rooms off the white hall in which Karmazinov had consented to read Merci. It is remarkable that the committee, and even the most practical people in it, attached enormous consequence to this reading. As for people of poetical tendencies, the marshal's wife, for instance, informed Karmazinov that after the reading she would immediately order a marble slab to be put up in the wall of the White Hall with an inscription in gold letters, that on such a day and year, here, in this place, the great writer of Russia and of Europe had read Merci on laying aside his pen, and so had for the first time taken leave of the Russian public represented by the leading citizens of our town, and that this inscription would be read by all at the ball that is, only five hours after Merci had been read. I know for a fact that Karmazinov it was who insisted that there should be no buffet in the morning on any account, while he was reading, in spite of some protests from members of the committee that this was rather opposed to our way of doing things. This was the position of affairs, while in the town people were still reckoning on a Belshazzar feast, that is, on refreshments provided by the committee, they believed in this to the last hour. Even the young ladies were dreaming of masses of sweets and preserves, and something more beyond their imagination. Everyone knew that the subscriptions had reached a huge sum, that all the town was struggling to go, that people were driving in from the surrounding districts, and that there were not tickets enough. It was known, too, that there had been some large subscriptions apart from the price paid for tickets, Vervara Petrovna, for instance, had paid 300 rubles for her ticket and had given almost all the flowers from her conservatory to decorate the room. The marshal's wife, who was a member of the committee, provided the house and the lighting, the club furnished the music, the attendance, and gave up Prohorovich for the whole day. There were other contributions as well, the lesser ones, so much so indeed that the idea was mooted of cutting down the price of tickets from 3 rubles to 2. Indeed, the committee were afraid at first that three rubles would be too much for young ladies to pay, and suggested that they might have family tickets, so that every family should pay for one daughter only, while the other young ladies of the family, even if there were a dozen specimens, should be admitted free. But all their apprehensions turned out to be groundless, it was just the young ladies who did come. Even the poorest clerks brought their girls, and it was quite evident that if they had had no girls it would never have occurred to them to subscribe for tickets. One insignificant little secretary brought all his seven daughters, to say nothing of his wife and a niece into the bargain, and every one of these persons held in her hand an entrance ticket that cost three rubles. It may be imagined what an upheaval it made in the town. One has only to remember that as the fate was divided into two parts every lady needed two costumes for the occasion, a morning one for the matinee and a ball dress for the evening. Many middle-class people, as it appeared afterwards, had pawned everything they had for that day, even the family linen, even the sheets, and possibly the mattresses, to the Jews, who had been settling in our town in great numbers during the previous two years and who became more and more numerous as time went on. Almost all the officials had asked for their salary in advance, and some of the landowners sold beasts they could ill spare, and all simply to bring their ladies got up as marchionesses, and to be as good as anybody. The magnificence of dresses on this occasion was something unheard of in our neighborhood. For a fortnight beforehand the town was overflowing with funny stories which were all brought by our wits to Yulia Mihailovna's court. Caricatures were passed from hand to hand. I have seen some drawings of the sort myself, in Yulia Mihailovna's album. All this reached the ears of the families who were the source of the jokes, I believe this was the cause of the general hatred of Yulia Mihailovna which had grown so strong in the town. People swear and gnash their teeth when they think of it now. But it was evident, even at the time, 
that if the committee were to displease them in anything, or if anything went wrong at the ball, the outburst of indignation would be something surprising. That's why everyone was secretly expecting a scandal, and if it was so confidently expected, how could it fail to come to pass? The orchestra struck up punctually at midday. Being one of the stewards, that is, one of the twelve young men with a rosette, I saw with my own eyes how this day of ignominious memory began. It began with an enormous crush at the doors. How was it that everything, including the police, went wrong that day? I don't blame the genuine public, the fathers of families did not crowd, nor did they push against anyone, in spite of their position. On the contrary, I am told that they were disconcerted even in the street, at the sight of the crowd shoving in a way unheard of in our town, besieging the entry and taking it by assault, instead of simply going in. Meanwhile the carriages kept driving up, and at last blocked the street. Now, at the time I write, I have good grounds for affirming that some of the lowest rabble of our town were brought in without tickets by Lamption and Liputin, possibly, too, by other people who were stewards like me. Anyway, some complete strangers, who had come from the surrounding districts and elsewhere, were present. As soon as these savages entered the hall they began asking where the buffet was, as though they had been put up to it beforehand, and learning that there was no buffet they began swearing with brutal directness, and an unprecedented insolence, some of them, it is true, were drunk when they came. Some of them were dazed like savages at the splendor of the hall, as they had never seen anything like it, and subsided for a minute gazing at it open-mouthed. This great white hall really was magnificent, though the building was falling into decay, it was of immense size, with two rows of windows, with an old-fashioned ceiling covered with gilt carving, with a gallery with mirrors on the walls, red and white draperies, marble statues, nondescript but still statues, with heavy old furniture of the Napoleonic period, white and gold, upholstered in red velvet. At the moment I am describing, a high platform had been put up for the literary gentlemen who were to read, and the whole hall was filled with chairs like the parterre of a theater with wide aisles for the audience. But after the first moments of surprise the most senseless questions and protests followed. Perhaps we don't care for a reading. We've paid our money. The audience has been impudently swindled. This is our entertainment, not the Lemkas. They seemed, in fact, to have been let in for this purpose. I remember specially an encounter in which the princeling with the stand-up collar and the face of a Dutch doll, whom I had met the morning before at Yulia Mihailovna's, distinguished himself. He had, at her urgent request, consented to pin a rosette on his left shoulder and to become one of our stewards. It turned out that this dumb wax figure could act after a fashion of his own if he could not talk. When a colossal pockmarked captain, supported by a herd of rabble following at his heels, pestered him by asking which way to the buffet, he made a sign to a police sergeant. His hint was promptly acted upon, and in spite of the drunken captain's abuse he was dragged out of the hall. Meantime the genuine public began to make its appearance, and stretched in three long files between the chairs. The disorderly elements began to subside, but the public, even the most respectable among them, had a dissatisfied and perplexed air, some of the ladies looked positively scared. At last all were seated, the music ceased. People began blowing their noses and looking about them. They waited with too solemn an air, which is always a bad sign. But nothing was to be seen yet of the Lemkas. Silks, velvets, diamonds glowed and sparkled on every side, whiffs of fragrance filled the air. The men were wearing all their decorations, and the old men were even in uniform. At last the marshal's wife came in with Liza. Liza had never been so dazzlingly charming or so splendidly dressed as that morning. Her hair was done up in curls, her eyes sparkled, a smile beamed on her face. She made an unmistakable sensation, people scrutinized her and whispered about her. They said that she was looking for Stavrogin, but neither Stavrogin nor Varvara Petrovna were there. At the time I did not understand the expression of her face, why was there so much happiness, such joy, such energy and strength in that face? I remembered what had happened the day before and could not make it out. But still the Lemkas did not come. This was distinctly a blunder. 
I learned that Yulia Mihailovna waited till the last minute for Pyotr Stepanovich, without whom she could not stir a step, though she never admitted it to herself. I must mention, in parenthesis, that on the previous day Pyotr Stepanovich had at the last meeting of the committee declined to wear the rosette of a steward, which had disappointed her dreadfully, even to the point of tears. To her surprise and, later on, her extreme discomfiture, to anticipate things, he vanished for the whole morning and did not make his appearance at the literary matinee at all, so that no one met him till evening. At last the audience began to manifest unmistakable signs of impatience. No one appeared on the platform either. The back rows began applauding, as in a theater. The elderly gentlemen and the ladies frowned. The Lemkas are really giving themselves unbearable airs. Even among the better part of the audience an absurd whisper began to gain ground that perhaps there would not be a fate at all, that Lemka perhaps was really unwell, and so on and so on. But, thank God, the Lemkas at last appeared, she was leaning on his arm, I must confess I was in great apprehension myself about their appearance. But the legends were disproved, and the truth was triumphant. The audience seemed relieved. Lemka himself seemed perfectly well. Everyone, I remember, was of that opinion, for it can be imagined how many eyes were turned on him. I may mention, as characteristic of our society, that there were very few of the better class people who saw reason to suppose that there was anything wrong with him, his conduct seemed to them perfectly normal, and so much so that the action he had taken in the square the morning before was accepted and approved. That's how it should have been from the first, the higher officials declared. If a man begins as a philanthropist he has to come to the same thing in the end, though he does not see that it was necessary from the point of view of philanthropy itself, that, at least, was the opinion at the club. They only blamed him for having lost his temper. It ought to have been done more coolly, but there, he is a new man, said the authorities. All eyes turned with equal eagerness to Yulia Mihailovna. Of course no one has the right to expect from me an exact account in regard to one point, that is a mysterious, a feminine question. But I only know one thing, on the evening of the previous day she had gone into Andrei Antonovich's study and was there with him till long after midnight. Andrei Antonovich was comforted and forgiven. The husband and wife came to a complete understanding, everything was forgotten, and when at the end of the interview Lemka went down on his knees, Recalling with horror the final incident of the previous night, the exquisite hand, and after it the lips of his wife, checked the fervent flow of penitent phrases of the chivalrously delicate gentleman who was limp with emotion. Everyone could see the happiness in her face. She walked in with an open-hearted air, wearing a magnificent dress. She seemed to be at the very pinnacle of her heart's desires, the fate, the goal and crown of her diplomacy, was an accomplished fact. As they walked to their seats in front of the platform, the Lemkas bowed in all directions and responded to greetings. They were at once surrounded. The marshal's wife got up to meet them. But at that point a horrid misunderstanding occurred, the orchestra, apropos of nothing, struck up a flourish, not a triumphal march of any kind, but a simple flourish such as was played at the club when someone's health was drunk at an official dinner. I know now that Lyamshin, in his capacity of steward, had arranged this, as though in honor of the Lemka's entrance. Of course he could always excuse it as a blunder or excessive zeal. Alas! I did not know at the time that they no longer cared even to find excuses, and that all such considerations were from that day a thing of the past. But the flourish was not the end of it, in the midst of the vexatious astonishment and the smiles of the audience there was a sudden hurrah from the end of the hall and from the gallery also, apparently in Lemka's honor. The hurrahs were few, but I must confess they lasted for some time. Yulia Mihailovna flushed, her eyes flashed. Lemka stood still at his chair, and turning towards the voices sternly and majestically scanned the audience. They hastened to make him sit down. I noticed with dismay the same dangerous smile on his face as he had worn the morning before, in his wife's drawing room, when he stared at Stepan Trofimovich before going up to him. It seemed to me that now, too, there was an ominous, and, worst of all, a rather comic expression on his countenance, 
the expression of a man resigned to sacrifice himself to satisfy his wife's lofty aims. Yulia Mihailovna beckoned to me hurriedly and whispered to me to run to Karmazinov and entreat him to begin. And no sooner had I turned away than another disgraceful incident, much more unpleasant than the first, took place. On the platform, the empty platform, on which till that moment all eyes and all expectations were fastened, and where nothing was to be seen but a small table, a chair in front of it, and on the table a glass of water on a silver salver, on the empty platform there suddenly appeared the colossal figure of Captain Lebiatkin wearing a dress coat and a white tie. I was so astounded I could not believe my eyes. The captain seemed confused and remained standing at the back of the platform. Suddenly there was a shout in the audience, Lebiatkin. You? The captain's stupid red face, he was hopelessly drunk, expanded in a broad vacant grin at this greeting. He raised his hand, rubbed his forehead with it, shook his shaggy head and, as though making up his mind to go through with it, took two steps forward and suddenly went off into a series of prolonged, blissful, gurgling, but not loud guffaws, which made him screw up his eyes and set all his bulky person heaving. This spectacle set almost half the audience laughing, twenty people applauded. The serious part of the audience looked at one another gloomily, it all lasted only half a minute, however. Liputin, wearing his steward's rosette, ran onto the platform with two servants, they carefully took the captain by both arms, while Liputin whispered something to him. The captain scowled, muttered, ah, uh, well, if that's it, waved his hand, turned his huge back to the public and vanished with his escort. But a minute later Litputin skipped on to the platform again. He was wearing the sweetest of his invariable smiles, which usually suggested vinegar and sugar, and carried in his hands a sheet of notepaper. With tiny but rapid steps he came forward to the edge of the platform. Ladies and gentlemen, he said, addressing the public, through our inadvertency there has arisen a comical misunderstanding which has been removed but I've hopefully undertaken to do something at the earnest and most respectful request of one of our local poets. Deeply touched by the humane and lofty object, in spite of his appearance, the object which has brought us all together, to wipe away the tears of the poor but well-educated girls of our province, this gentleman, I mean this local poet, although desirous of preserving his incognito, would gladly have heard his poem read at the beginning of the ball, that is, I mean, of the matinee. Though this poem is not in the program, for it has only been received half an hour ago, yet it has seemed to us, us? Whom did he mean by us? I report his confused and incoherent speech word for word, that through its remarkable naivete of feeling, together with its equally remarkable gaiety, the poem might well be read, that is, not as something serious, but as something appropriate to the occasion, that is to the idea, especially as some lines. And I wanted to ask the kind permission of the audience. Read it, boomed a voice at the back of the hall. Then I am to read it? Read it, read it, cried many voices. With the permission of the audience I will read it, Litputin minced again, still with the same sugary smile. He still seemed to hesitate, and I even thought that he was rather excited. These people are sometimes nervous in spite of their impudence. A divinity student would have carried it through without winking, but Liputin did, after all, belong to the last generation. I must say, that is, I have the honor to say by way of preface, that it is not precisely an ode such as used to be written for fates, but is rather, so to say, a jest, but full of undoubted feeling, together with playful humor, and, so to say, the most realistic truthfulness. Read it, read it. He unfolded the paper. No one of course was in time to stop him. Besides, he was wearing his steward's badge. In a ringing voice he declaimed. To the local governesses of the fatherland from the poet at the fate. Governesses all, good morrow, triumph on this festive day. Retrograde or vowed George Sander, never mind, just frisk away. But that's Lebiadkins. Lebiadkins, cried several voices. There was laughter and even applause, though not from very many. 
Teaching French to wet-nosed children, you are glad enough to think you can catch a worn-out sexton, even he is worth a wink. Hurrah! Hurrah! But in these great days of progress, ladies, to your sorrow no, you can't even catch a sexton, if you have not got a dot dot. To be sure, to be sure, that's realism. You can't hook a husband without a dot. But, henceforth, since through our feasting capital is flowed from all, and we send you forth to conquest dancing, dowried from this hall retrograde or vowed George Sander, never mind, rejoice you may, you're a governess with a dowry, spit on all and frisk away. I must confess I could not believe my ears. The insolence of it was so unmistakable that there was no possibility of excusing Lipiton on the ground of stupidity. Besides, Lipiton was by no means stupid. The intention was obvious, to me, anyway, they seemed in a hurry to create disorder. Some lines in these idiotic verses, for instance the last, were such that no stupidity could have let them pass. Lipiton himself seemed to feel that he had undertaken too much, when he had achieved his exploit he was so overcome by his own impudence that he did not even leave the platform but remained standing, as though there were something more he wanted to say. He had probably imagined that it would somehow produce a different effect, but even the group of ruffians who had applauded during the reading suddenly sank into silence, as though they, too, were overcome. What was silliest of all, many of them took the whole episode seriously, that is, did not regard the verses as a lampoon but actually thought it realistic and true as regards the governesses, a poem with a tendency, in fact. But the excessive freedom of the verses struck even them at last, as for the general public they were not only scandalized but obviously offended. I am sure I am not mistaken as to the impression. Yulia Mihailovna said afterwards that in another moment she would have fallen into a swoon. One of the most respectable old gentlemen helped his old wife on to her feet, and they walked out of the hall accompanied by the agitated glances of the audience. Who knows, the example might have infected others if Karmazinov himself, wearing a dress coat and a white tie and carrying a manuscript, in his hand, had not appeared on the platform at that moment. Yulia Mihailovna turned an ecstatic gaze at him as on her deliverer. But I was by that time behind the scenes. I was in quest of Liputin. You did that on purpose. I said, seizing him indignantly by the arm. I assure you I never thought, he began, cringing and lying at once, pretending to be unhappy. The verses had only just been brought and I thought that as an amusing pleasantry. You did not think anything of the sort. You can't really think that stupid rubbish an amusing pleasantry? Yes, I do. You are simply lying, and it wasn't brought to you just now. You helped Levy Adkin to compose it yourself, yesterday very likely, to create a scandal. The last verse must have been yours, the part about the sexton too. Why did he come on in a dress coat? You must have meant him to read it, too, if he had not been drunk? Liputin looked at me coldly and ironically. What business is it of yours? he asked suddenly with strange calm. What business is it of mine? You are wearing the steward's badge, too. Where is Pyotr Stepanovich? I don't know, somewhere here, why do you ask? Because now I see through it. It's simply a plot against Yulia Mihailovna so as to ruin the day by a scandal. Liputin looked at me askance again. But what is it to you, he said, grinning. He shrugged his shoulders and walked away. It came over me with a rush. All my suspicions were confirmed. Till then, I had been hoping I was mistaken. What was I to do? I was on the point of asking the advice of Stepan Trofimovich, but he was standing before the looking glass, trying on different smiles, and continually consulting a piece of paper on which he had notes. He had to go on immediately after Karmazinov, and was not in a fit state for conversation. 
Should I run to Yulia Mihailovna? But it was too soon to go to her. She needed a much sterner lesson to cure her of her conviction that she had a following and that everyone was fanatically devoted to her. She would not have believed me and would have thought I was dreaming. Besides, what help could she be? Eh, I thought, after all, what business is it of mine? I'll take off my badge and go home when it begins. That was my mental phrase, when it begins, I remember it. But I had to go and listen to Karmazinov. Taking a last look round behind the scenes, I noticed that a good number of outsiders, even women among them, were flitting about, going in and out. Behind the scenes was rather a narrow space completely screened from the audience by a curtain and communicating with other rooms by means of a passage. Here our readers were awaiting their turns. But I was struck at that moment by the reader who was to follow Stepan Trofimovich. He, too, was some sort of professor, I don't know to this day exactly what he was, who had voluntarily left some educational institution after a disturbance among the students and had arrived in the town only a few days before. He, too, had been recommended to Yulia Mihailovna, and she had received him with reverence. I know now that he had only spent one evening in her company before the reading, he had not spoken all that evening, had listened with an equivocal smile to the jests and the general tone of the company surrounding Yulia Mihailovna, and had made an unpleasant impression on everyone by his air of haughtiness, and at the same time almost timorous readiness to take offense. It was Yulia Mihailovna herself who had enlisted his services. Now he was walking from corner to corner, and, like Stepan Trofimovich, was muttering to himself, though he looked on the ground instead of in the looking glass. He was not trying on smiles, though he often smiled rapaciously. It was obvious that it was useless to speak to him either. He looked about forty, was short and bald, had a grayish beard, and was decently dressed. But what was most interesting about him was that at every turn he took he threw up his right fist, brandished it above his head and suddenly brought it down again as though crushing an antagonist to atoms. He went through this byplay every moment. It made me uncomfortable. I hastened away to listen to Karmazinov. 3. There was a feeling in the hall that something was wrong again. Let me state to begin with that I have the deepest reverence for genius, but why do our geniuses in the decline of their illustrious years behave sometimes exactly like little boys? What though he was Karmazinov, and came forward with as much dignity as five camera hairs rolled into one. How could he expect to keep an audience like ours listening for a whole hour to a single paper? I have observed, in fact, that however big a genius a man may be, he can't monopolize the attention of an audience at a frivolous literary matinee for more than twenty minutes with impunity. The entrance of the great writer was received, indeed, with the utmost respect, even the severest elderly men showed signs of approval and interest, and the ladies even displayed some enthusiasm. The applause was brief, however, and somehow uncertain and not unanimous. Yet there was no unseemly behavior in the back rows, till Karmazinov began to speak, not that anything very bad followed then, but only a sort of misunderstanding. I have mentioned already that he had rather a shrill voice, almost feminine in fact, and at the same time a genuinely aristocratic lisp. He had hardly articulated a few words when someone had the effrontery to laugh aloud, probably some ignorant simpleton who knew nothing of the world, and was congenitally disposed to laughter. But there was nothing like a hostile demonstration, on the contrary people said SHH, and the offender was crushed. But Mr. Karmazinov, with an affected air and intonation, announced that at first he had declined absolutely to read. Much need there was to mention it. There are some lines which come so deeply from the heart that it is impossible to utter them aloud, so that these holy things cannot be laid before the public, why lay them then? But as he had been begged to do so, he was doing so, and as he was, moreover, laying down his pen forever, and had sworn to write no more, he had written this last farewell, and as he had sworn never, on any inducement, to read anything in public, and so on, and so on, all in that style. But all that would not have mattered, everyone knows what authors' prefaces are like, though, I may observe, that considering the lack of culture of our audience and the irritability of the back rows, 
all this may have had an influence. Surely it would have been better to have read a little story, a short tale such as he had written in the past over-elaborate, that is, an affected, but sometimes witty. It would have saved the situation. No, this was quite another story. It was a regular oration. Good heavens, what wasn't there in it? I am positive that it would have reduced to rigidity even a Petersburg audience, let alone ours. Imagine an article that would have filled some thirty pages of print of the most affected, aimless prattle, and to make matters worse, the gentleman read it with a sort of melancholy condescension as though it were a favor, so that it was almost insulting to the audience. The subject. Who could make it out? It was a sort of description of certain impressions and reminiscences. But of what? And about what? Though the leading intellects of the province did their utmost during the first half of the reading, they could make nothing of it, and they listened to the second part simply out of politeness. A great deal was said about love, indeed, of the love of the genius for some person, but I must admit it made rather an awkward impression. For the great writer to tell us about his first kiss seemed to my mind a little incongruous with his short and fat little figure. Another thing that was offensive, these kisses did not occur as they do with the rest of mankind. There had to be a framework of gorse, it had to be gorse or some such plant that one must look up in a flora, and there had to be a tint of purple in the sky, such as no mortal had ever observed before, or if some people had seen it, they had never noticed it, but he seemed to say, I have seen it and am describing it to you, fools, as if it were a most ordinary thing. The tree under which the interesting couple sat had of course to be of an orange color. They were sitting somewhere in Germany. Suddenly they see Pompey or Cassius on the eve of a battle, and both are penetrated by a thrill of ecstasy. Some wood nymphs squeaked in the bushes. Gluck played the violin among the reeds. The title of the piece he was playing was given in full, but no one knew it, so that one would have had to look it up in a musical dictionary. Meanwhile a fog came on, such a fog, such a fog that it was more like a million pillows than a fog. And suddenly everything disappears and the great genius is crossing the frozen Volga in a thaw. Two and a half pages are filled with the crossing, and yet he falls through the ice. The genius is drowning, you imagine he was drowned? Not a bit of it, this was simply in order that when he was drowning and at his last gasp, he might catch sight of a bit of ice, the size of a pea, but pure and crystal as a frozen tear and in that tear was reflected Germany, or more accurately the sky of Germany, and its iridescent sparkle recalled to his mind the very tear which dost thou remember, fell from thine eyes when we were sitting under that emerald tree, and thou didst cry out joyfully, there is no crime. No, I said through my tears, but if that is so, there are no righteous either. We sobbed and parted forever. She went off somewhere to the seacoast, while he went to visit some caves, and then he descends and descends and descends for three years under Shuharev Tower in Moscow, and suddenly in the very bowels of the earth, he finds in a cave a lamp, and before the lamp a hermit. The hermit is praying. The genius leans against a little barred window, and suddenly hears a sigh. Do you suppose it was the hermit sighing? Much he cares about the hermit. Not a bit of it, this sigh simply reminds him of her first sigh, thirty-seven years before, in Germany, when, dost thou remember, we sat under an agate tree and thou didst say to me, why love? See okra is growing all around and I love thee, but the okra will cease to grow, and I shall cease to love. Then the fog comes on again, Hoffman appears on the scene, the wood nymph whistles a tune from Chopin, and suddenly out of the fog appears Ancus Martius over the roofs of Rome, wearing a laurel wreath. A chill of ecstasy ran down our backs and we parted forever, and so on and so on. Perhaps I am not reporting it quite right and don't know how to report it, but the drift of the babble was something of that sort. And after all, how disgraceful this passion of our great intellects for jesting in a superior way really is. The great European philosopher, the great man of science, the inventor, the martyr, all these who labor and are heavy laden, are to the great Russian genius no more than so many cooks in his kitchen. He is the master and they come to him, cap in hand, awaiting orders. It is true he jeers superciliously at Russia too, and there is nothing he likes better than exhibiting the bankruptcy of Russia in every relation before the great minds of Europe, 
but as regards himself, no, he is at a higher level than all the great minds of Europe, they are only material for his jests. He takes another man's idea, tacks on to it its antithesis, and the epigram is made. There is such a thing as crime, there is no such thing as crime, there is no such thing as justice, there are no just men, atheism, Darwinism, the Moscow Bells. But alas, he no longer believes in the Moscow Bells, Rome, laurels. But he has no belief in laurels even. We have a conventional attack of Byronic spleen, a grimace from Heine, something of Petrin, and the machine goes on rolling, whistling, at full speed. But you may praise me, you may praise me, that I like extremely, it's only in a manner of speaking that I lay down the pen, I shall bore you three hundred times more, you'll grow weary of reading me. Of course it did not end without trouble, but the worst of it was that it was his own doing. People had for some time begun shuffling their feet, blowing their noses, coughing, and doing everything that people do when a lecturer, whoever he may be, keeps an audience for longer than twenty minutes at a literary matinee. But the genius noticed nothing of all this. He went on lisping and mumbling, without giving a thought to the audience, so that everyone began to wonder. Suddenly in a back row a solitary but loud voice was heard. Good Lord, what nonsense! The exclamation escaped involuntarily, and I am sure was not intended as a demonstration. The man was simply worn out. But Mr. Karmazinov stopped, looked sarcastically at the audience, and suddenly lisped with the deportment of an aggrieved camera hair. I'm afraid I've been boring you dreadfully, gentlemen. That was his blunder, that he was the first to speak, for provoking an answer in this way he gave an opening for the rabble to speak, too, and even legitimately, so to say, while if he had restrained himself, people would have gone on blowing their noses and it would have passed off somehow. Perhaps he expected applause in response to his question, but there was no sound of applause, on the contrary, everyone seemed to subside and shrink back in dismay. You never did see Ancus Martius, that's all brag, cried a voice that sounded full of irritation and even nervous exhaustion. Just so, another voice agreed at once. There are no such things as ghosts nowadays, nothing but natural science. Look it up in a scientific book. Gentlemen, there was nothing I expected less than such objections, said Karmazinov, extremely surprised. The great genius had completely lost touch with his fatherland in Karlsruhe. Nowadays it's outrageous to say that the world stands on three fishes, a young lady snapped out suddenly. You can't have gone down to the hermit's cave, Karmazinov. And who talks about hermits nowadays? Gentlemen, what surprises me most of all is that you take it all so seriously. However, however, you are perfectly right. No one has greater respect for truth and realism than I have. Though he smiled ironically he was tremendously overcome. His face seemed to express, I am not the sort of man you think, I am on your side, only praise me, praise me more, as much as possible, I like it extremely. Gentlemen, he cried, completely mortified at last, I see that my poor poem is quite out of place here. And, indeed, I am out of place here myself, I think. You threw at the crow and you hit the cow, some fool, probably drunk, shouted at the top of his voice, and of course no notice ought to have been taken of him. It is true there was a sound of disrespectful laughter. A cow, you say? Karmazinov caught it up at once, his voice grew shriller and shriller. As for crows and cows, gentlemen, I will refrain. I've too much respect for any audience to permit myself comparisons, however harmless, but I did think. You'd better be careful, sir, someone shouted from a back row. But I had supposed that laying aside my pen and saying farewell to my readers, I should be heard. No, no, we want to hear you, we want to, a few voices from the front row plucked up spirit to exclaim at last. 
Reed read, several enthusiastic ladies' voices chimed in, and at last there was an outburst of applause, sparse and feeble, it is true. Believe me, Karmazinov, everyone looks on it as an honor, the marshal's wife herself could not resist saying. Mr. Karmazinov, cried a fresh young voice in the back of the hall suddenly. It was the voice of a very young teacher from the district school who had only lately come among us, an excellent young man, quiet and gentlemanly. He stood up in his place. Mr. Karmazinov, if I had the happiness to fall in love as you have described to us, I really shouldn't refer to my love in an article intended for public reading, he flushed red all over. Ladies and gentlemen, cried Karmazinov, I have finished. I will omit the end and withdraw. Only allow me to read the six last lines. Yes, dear reader, farewell, he began at once from the manuscript without sitting down again in his chair. Farewell, reader, I do not greatly insist on our parting friends, what need to trouble you, indeed. You may abuse me, abuse me as you will if it affords you any satisfaction. But best of all if we forget one another forever. And if you all, readers, were suddenly so kind as to fall on your knees and begin begging me with tears, write, oh, write for us, Karmazinov, for the sake of Russia, for the sake of posterity, to win laurels, even then I would answer you, thanking you, of course, with every courtesy, no, we've had enough of one another, dear fellow countrymen, merci. It's time we took our separate ways. Merci, merci, merci. Karmazinov bowed ceremoniously, and, as red as though he had been cooked, retired behind the scenes. Nobody would go down on their knees, a wild idea. What conceit! That's only humor, someone more reasonable suggested. Spare me your humor. I call it impudence, gentlemen. Well, he's finished now, anyway. Eck, what a dull show. But all these ignorant exclamations in the back rows, though they were confined to the back rows, were drowned in applause from the other half of the audience. They called for Karmazinov. Several ladies with Yulia Mihailovna and the marshal's wife crowded round the platform. In Yulia Mihailovna's hands was a gorgeous laurel wreath resting on another wreath of living roses on a white velvet cushion. Laurels. Karmazinov pronounced with a subtle and rather sarcastic smile. I am touched, of course, and accept with real emotion this wreath prepared beforehand, but still fresh and unwithered, but I assure you, mesdames, that I have suddenly become so realistic that I feel laurels would in this age be far more appropriate in the hands of a skillful cook than in mine. Well, a cook is more useful, cried the divinity student, who had been at the meeting at Virginsky's. There was some disorder. In many rows people jumped up to get a better view of the presentation of the laurel wreath. I give another three rubles for a cook this minute, another voice assented loudly, too loudly, insistently, in fact. So would I. And I. Is it possible there's no buffet? Gentlemen, it's simply a swindle. It must be admitted, however, that all these unbridled gentlemen still stood in awe of our higher officials and of the police superintendent, who was present in the hall. Ten minutes later all had somehow got back into their places, but there was not the same good order as before. And it was into this incipient chaos that poor Stepan Trofimovich was thrust. 4. I ran out to him behind the scenes once more and had time to warn him excitedly that in my opinion the game was up, that he had better not appear at all, but had better go home at once on the excuse of his usual ailment, for instance, and I would take off my badge and come with him. At that instant he was on his way to the platform, he stopped suddenly, and haughtily looking me up and down he pronounced solemnly. What grounds have you, sir, for thinking me capable of such baseness? I drew back. 
I was as sure as twice to make for that he would not get off without a catastrophe. Meanwhile, as I stood utterly dejected, I saw moving before me again the figure of the professor, whose turn it was to appear after Stepan Trofimovich, and who kept lifting up his fist and bringing it down again with a swing. He kept walking up and down, absorbed in himself and muttering something to himself with a diabolical but triumphant smile. I somehow almost unintentionally went up to him. I don't know what induced me to meddle again. Do you know, I said, judging from many examples, if a lecturer keeps an audience for more than twenty minutes it won't go on listening. No celebrity is able to hold his own for half an hour. He stopped short and seemed almost quivering with resentment. Infinite disdain was expressed in his countenance. Don't trouble yourself, he muttered contemptuously and walked on. At that moment Stepan Trofimovich's voice rang out in the hall. Oh, hang you all, I thought, and ran to the hall. Stepan Trofimovich took his seat in the lecturer's chair in the midst of the still persisting disorder. He was greeted by the first rows with looks which were evidently not over-friendly. Of late, at the club, people almost seemed not to like him, and treated him with much less respect than formerly. But it was something to the good that he was not hissed. I had had a strange idea in my head ever since the previous day, I kept fancying that he would be received with hisses as soon as he appeared. They scarcely noticed him, however, in the disorder. What could that man hope for if Karmazinov was treated like this? He was pale, it was ten years since he had appeared before an audience. From his excitement and from all that I knew so well in him, it was clear to me that he, too, regarded his present appearance on the platform as a turning point of his fate, or something of the kind. That was just what I was afraid of. The man was dear to me. And what were my feelings when he opened his lips and I heard his first phrase? Ladies and gentlemen, he pronounced suddenly, as though resolved to venture everything, though in an almost breaking voice. Ladies and gentlemen, only this morning there lay before me one of the illegal leaflets that have been distributed here lately, and I asked myself for the hundredth time, wherein lies its secret? The whole hall became instantly still, all looks were turned to him, some with positive alarm. There was no denying, he knew how to secure their interest from the first word. Heads were thrust out from behind the scenes, Liputin and Lyamshin listened greedily. Yulia Mihailovna waved to me again. Stop him, whatever happens, stop him, she whispered in agitation. I could only shrug my shoulders, how could one stop a man resolved to venture everything? Alas, I understood what was in Stepan Trofimovich's mind. Ha, the manifestos, was whispered in the audience, the whole hall was stirred. Ladies and gentlemen, I've solved the whole mystery. The whole secret of their effect lies in their stupidity. His eyes flashed. Yes, gentlemen, if this stupidity were intentional, pretended and calculated, oh, that would be a stroke of genius. But we must do them justice, they don't pretend anything. It's the barest, most simple-hearted, most shallow stupidity. C'est la bêtise dans son essence la plus pure, quelque chose comme un simple chimique. If it were expressed ever so little more cleverly, everyone would see at once the poverty of this shallow stupidity. But as it is, everyone is left wondering, no one can believe that it is such elementary stupidity. It's impossible that there's nothing more in it, everyone says to himself and tries to find the secret of it, sees a mystery in it, tries to read between the lines, the effect is attained. Oh, never has stupidity been so solemnly rewarded, though it has so often deserved it. For, in parenthesis, stupidity is of as much service to humanity as the loftiest genius. Epigram of 1840 was commented, in a very modest voice, however, but it was followed by a general outbreak of noise and uproar. Ladies and gentlemen, hurrah! I propose a toast to stupidity, cried Stepan Trofimovich, defying the audience in a perfect frenzy. 
I ran up on the pretext of pouring out some water for him. Stepan Trofimovich, leave off, Yulia Mihailovna entreats you to. No, you leave me alone, idle young man, he cried out at me at the top of his voice. I ran away. Messers, he went on, why this excitement, why the outcries of indignation I hear? I have come forward with an olive branch. I bring you the last word, for in this business I have the last word, and we shall be reconciled. Down with him, shouted some. Hush, let him speak, let him have his say, yelled another section. The young teacher was particularly excited, having once brought himself to speak he seemed now unable to be silent. Messers, the last word in this business is forgiveness. I, an old man at the end of my life, I solemnly declare that the spirit of life breathes in us still, and there is still a living strength in the young generation. The enthusiasm of the youth of today is as pure and bright as in our age. All that has happened is a change of aim, the replacing of one beauty by another. The whole difficulty lies in the question which is more beautiful, Shakespeare or Booth's, Raphael or Petroleum. It's treachery, growled some. Compromising questions. Agent provocateur. But I maintain, Stepan Trofimovich shrilled at the utmost pitch of excitement, I maintain that Shakespeare and Raphael are more precious than the emancipation of the serfs, more precious than nationalism, more precious than socialism, more precious than the young generation, more precious than chemistry, more precious than almost all humanity because they are the fruit, the real fruit of all humanity and perhaps the highest fruit that can be. A form of beauty already attained, but for the attaining of which I would not perhaps consent to live. Oh, heavens, he cried, clasping his hands, ten years ago I said the same thing from the platform in Petersburg, exactly the same thing, in the same words, and in just the same way they did not understand it, they laughed and hissed as now, shallow people, what is lacking in you that you cannot understand? But let me tell you, let me tell you, without the English, life is still possible for humanity. Without Germany, life is possible, without the Russians it is only too possible, without science, without bread, life is possible only without beauty it is impossible, for there will be nothing left in the world. That's the secret at the bottom of everything, that's what history teaches. Even science would not exist a moment without beauty, do you know that, you who laugh it will sink into bondage, you won't invent a nail even. I won't yield an inch, he shouted absurdly in confusion and with all his might banged his fist on the table. But all the while that he was shrieking senselessly and incoherently, the disorder in the hall increased. Many people jumped up from their seats, some dashed forward, nearer to the platform. It all happened much more quickly than I describe it, and there was no time to take steps, perhaps no wish to, either. It's all right for you, with everything found for you, you pampered creatures, the same divinity student bellowed at the foot of the platform, grinning with relish at Stepan Trofimovich, who noticed it and darted to the very edge of the platform. Haven't I, haven't I just declared that the enthusiasm of the young generation is as pure and bright as it was, and that it is coming to grief through being deceived only in the forms of beauty? Isn't that enough for you? And if you consider that he who proclaims this is a father crushed and insulted, can one, oh, shallow hearts, can one rise to greater heights of impartiality and fairness? Ungrateful, unjust. Why, why can't you be reconciled? And he burst into hysterical sobs. He wiped away his dropping tears with his fingers. His shoulders and breast were heaving with sobs. He was lost to everything in the world. A perfect panic came over the audience, almost all got up from their seats. Yulia Mihailovna, too, jumped up quickly, seizing her husband by the arm and pulling him up too. The scene was beyond all belief. Stepan Trofimovich, the divinity student roared gleefully. There's Fedka the convict wandering about the town and the neighborhood, escaped from prison. He is a robber and has recently committed another murder. Allow me to ask you, 
if you had not sold him as a recruit 15 years ago to pay a gambling debt, that is, more simply, lost him at cards, tell me, would he have got into prison? Would he have cut men's throats now, in his struggle for existence? What do you say, Mr. Esthete? I declined to describe the scene that followed. To begin with there was a furious volley of applause. The applause did not come from all, probably from some fifth part of the audience, but they applauded furiously. The rest of the public made for the exit, but as the applauding part of the audience kept pressing forward towards the platform, there was a regular block. The ladies screamed, some of the girls began to cry and asked to go home. Lemka, standing up by his chair, kept gazing wildly about him. Yulia Mihailovna completely lost her head for the first time during her career amongst us. As for Stepan Trofimovich, for the first moment he seemed literally crushed by the divinity student's words, but he suddenly raised his arms as though holding them out above the public and yelled. I shake the dust from off my feet and I curse you. It's the end, the end. And turning, he ran behind the scenes, waving his hands menacingly. He has insulted the audience. For Hovensky, the angry section roared. They even wanted to rush in pursuit of him. It was impossible to appease them, at the moment, anyway, and a final catastrophe broke like a bomb on the assembly and exploded in its midst. The third reader, the maniac who kept waving his fist behind the scenes, suddenly ran onto the platform. He looked like a perfect madman. With a broad, triumphant smile, full of boundless self-confidence, he looked round at the agitated hall and he seemed to be delighted at the disorder. He was not in the least disconcerted at having to speak in such an uproar, on the contrary, he was obviously delighted. This was so obvious that it attracted attention at once. What's this now? People were heard asking. Who is this? S.H.H. What does he want to say? Ladies and gentlemen, the maniac shouted with all his might, standing at the very edge of the platform and speaking with almost as shrill, feminine a voice as Karmazinov's, but without the aristocratic lisp. Ladies and gentlemen. Twenty years ago, on the eve of war with half Europe, Russia was regarded as an ideal country by officials of all ranks. Literature was in the service of the censorship, military drill was all that was taught at the universities, the troops were trained like a ballet, and the peasants paid the taxes and were mute under the lash of serfdom. Patriotism meant the ringing of bribes from the quick and the dead. Those who did not take bribes were looked upon as rebels because they disturbed the general harmony. The birch copses were extirpated in support of discipline. Europe trembled. But never in the thousand years of its senseless existence had Russia sunk to such ignominy. He raised his fist, waved it ecstatically and menacingly over his head and suddenly brought it down furiously, as though pounding an adversary to powder. A frantic yell rose from the whole hall, there was a deafening roar of applause, almost half the audience was applauding, their enthusiasm was excusable. Russia was being put to shame publicly, before everyone. Who could fail to roar with delight? This is the real thing. Come, this is something like. Hurrah! Yes, this is none of your aesthetics. The maniac went on ecstatically. Twenty years have passed since then. Universities have been opened and multiplied. Military drill has passed into a legend. Officers are too few by thousands, the railways have eaten up all the capital and have covered Russia as with a spider's web, so that in another fifteen years one will perhaps get somewhere. Bridges are rarely on fire, and fires in towns occur only at regular intervals, in turn, at the proper season. In the law courts judgments are as wise as Solomon's, and the jury only take bribes through the struggle for existence, to escape starvation. The serfs are free and flog one another instead of being flogged by the landowners. Seas and oceans of vodka are consumed to support the budget, and in Novgorod, 
Opposite the ancient and useless Saint Sophia, there has been solemnly put up a colossal bronze globe to celebrate a thousand years of disorder and confusion, Europe scowls and begins to be uneasy again. Fifteen years of reforms. And yet never even in the most grotesque periods of its madness has Russia sunk. The last words could not be heard in the roar of the crowd. One could see him again raise his arm and bring it down triumphantly again. Enthusiasm was beyond all bounds, people yelled, clapped their hands, even some of the ladies shouted, enough, you can't beat that. Some might have been drunk. The orator scanned them all and seemed reveling in his own triumph. I caught a glimpse of Lemka in indescribable excitement, pointing something out to somebody. Yulia Mihailovna, with a pale face, said something in haste to the prince, who had run up to her. But at that moment a group of six men, officials more or less, burst onto the platform, seized the orator and dragged him behind the scenes. I can't understand how he managed to tear himself away from them, but he did escape, darted up to the edge of the platform again and succeeded in shouting again, at the top of his voice, waving his fist, but never has Russia sunk. But he was dragged away again. I saw some fifteen men dash behind the scenes to rescue him, not crossing the platform but breaking down the light screen at the side of it. I saw afterwards, though I could hardly believe my eyes, the girl student, Virginsky's sister, leap onto the platform with the same roll under her arm, dressed as before, as plump and rosy as ever, surrounded by two or three women and two or three men, and accompanied by her mortal enemy, the schoolboy. I even caught the phrase. Ladies and gentlemen, I've come to call attention to the sufferings of poor students and to rouse them to a general protest. But I ran away. Hiding my badge in my pocket I made my way from the house into the street by back passages which I knew of. First of all, of course, I went to Stepan Trofimovich's.